For seven years, they had unbelievable success. Seven countries obliterated, 31 kings defeated, 10,000 square miles of prime real estate claimed. The Hebrew people were unstoppable. They hadn't always been. For four centuries, they lived as slaves in Egypt. For 40 years, they wandered like Bedouins in the desert. For 300 years, they suffered during the dark age of judges. They didn't thrive. But did, during those seven years, they did. That's when the Jordan River stopped. The Jericho walls fell down. The sun stood still. And the kings of Canaan were banished. What they accomplished was so amazing, the historian wrote, so the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give their ancestors, and they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their ancestors. Not one of their enemies withstood them. The Lord gave all their enemies into their hands. Not one of the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. Wow. A new season was born. Maybe you need a new season. You don't need to cross the Jordan River, but you need to heal a broken heart. You aren't up against the walls of Jericho, but you need the strength to face death or disease or discouragement. Sometimes the challenge is just too much. You run out of fight. Life have is, has its ways of taking the life out of us. The book of Joshua is in the Bible for such seasons. It challenges us to believe that our best days are ahead of us. God has a promised land for us to take. The promised land was the third stop in the Hebrews' journey. The first stop was in Egypt where they were slaves to Pharaoh. The second was the wilderness where they were enslaved to fear. In Canaan, they discovered victory. We too have traveled this way. Egypt represents our days in bondage to sin before we knew Christ. He freed us from our old life and offered us a brand new life in Canaan. In our promised land life, Apostle Paul tells us we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. Canaan symbolizes the victory we can have today. And Canaan is not a metaphor for heaven. In heaven there will be no enemies. Canaan had at least seven enemy nations. Canaan does not represent the life to come. Canaan represents the life we can have today. Now, Canaan represents the victorious Christian life. The wilderness represents the defeated Christian life. In the wilderness, the Hebrews walked in circles. Victories were scarce. They were saved, but not strong. Saved from Pharaoh, but stuck in the desert. Sounds awful. It might sound familiar. I know many Christians who say they are stuck, in a rut, stalled. They can tell you the day they escaped, escaped, e escaped Egypt, but they can't tell you the last time they defeated a temptation or experienced an answered prayer. They are not alone in the wilderness. Willow Creek Community Church uh, uh, published a book called Reveal, in which they interviewed 200,000 Christians. They wanted to determine if uh, what percentage of churchgoers are propelled by God's power to love God and love people with their whole hearts. How many Christians would you say are experiencing the power of the promised land life? You want to venture a percent? Anybody? 10%? You're pretty close. We better stay there. 11%. Nearly 9 out of 10 percent, 9 out of 10 believers, in other words, languish in the wilderness. Saved? Yes. Empowered? No. They waste away in the land in between. Out of Egypt, 
but not yet in Canaan. 11%. If a high school graduated only 11% of its students, if a retail store sold only 11% of its items, if a plumber completed only 11% of his projects, if a basketball team won only 11% of its games, wouldn't changes be made? The church has a lot of work to do. We also have a great opportunity. About 2.3 billion people on the earth call themselves Christians. If the survey is any, any indication, about 2 billion of those Christians are struggling on a fraction of their horsepower. What would happen if they got a tune-up? How would the world be different if two billion Christians came out of the wilderness? How many marriages would be saved? How many homes would be transformed? How many schools would be changed? How much hunger would be eliminated? If you began to live the promised land life, how would you be different? Do you sense a disconnect between the promises of the Bible and the reality in your life? How do we dis explain the disconnect with so many of us caught in the land in between Egypt and Canaan? If you've invited Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit dwells inside you. You have the same power which God used when he raised Christ from the dead living inside of you. So why do we struggle with life? Our inheritance in Christ grants us perfect peace, but we feel like we're a perfect mess. Why? I can think of four reasons. One, we don't believe in our inheritance. We just simply don't believe that God has a spirit-powered life available to us. Sixty times we read in the book of Joshua that the people of Israel are to rise up and take possession of their inheritance. God told Abraham 500 years earlier that he was promising the land of Canaan as his inheritance. So Joshua let the people depart, each to his own inheritance. Is it time for you to possess your inheritance? You have one. If you've given your life to Christ, God has given Canaan to you. He has blessed us in the heavenly realm with every spiritual blessing. Notice, he has blessed, not he will bless or might bless. This may well be the best kept secret in Christendom. We underestimate what happened to us at conversion. Many Christians view their conversion sort of like going through a car wash. They come in a filthy clunker, and then they come out with their sins washed away, a cleansed clunker. But conversion is way more than a removal of sin. It's a deposit of power. It's as if your high-mileage two-cylinder engine has been removed and in place has been put a mounted in your frame a brand new Ferrari engine. God removed the old motor, caked and cracked and broken with sin and evil, and replaced it with a roaring, humming version of himself. He embedded you with the essence of Christ. So the Apostle Paul writes, read this with me. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. And then Paul also writes, read this with me. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Paul says we have incomparably great power within us. 
But we often live as if we don't know it. That was the problem with Joshua's ancestors. They didn't really believe God could give them the land. They were afraid to possess their inheritance. Don't make the same mistake. Receive yours. You are embedded with resurrection power. Though you can't control your tongue, God can. Though you can't control your sexual urges, God can. Though you can't forgive, God can. And with Him, you can. The wilderness mentality, wilderness mentality says, I am weak and I'll always be weak. Inheritance people say, I was weak, but I'm getting stronger. Wilderness people say, I'm a victim of my circumstances. Promised land people say, I'm a victor in spite of my circumstances. Wilderness people say, these are tough days. I'll never get through them. God's people say, I have incomparably great power. God will get me through. Imagine what would happen if a generation of Christians lived out their inheritance. Men and women would turn off internet porn. The lonely would find comfort in God rather than in the arms of strangers. Struggling, couple, struggling couples would spend more time in prayer and less time in anger. Children would consider it a privilege to take care of their aging parents. Teenagers would respect their parents. Joshua believed in his inheritance. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, what man in the Bible had no parents? Joshua, son of Nun. <laughs> Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites. God told Joshua to get ready to possess their inheritance. He did. He didn't know what would happen when they crossed the Jordan River, but he believed God, even though it was a risk. Jeff Bezos saw an opportunity to earn money on the Internet. He knew that uh, internet startups have a 1 in 10 chance of success. He figured he had a 30% shot. That's what he told his investors, family and friends. When he gathered, he says, there's a 70% chance you're going to lose all your money. So don't invest if you can't afford to lose it. They invested and now they're rich. Jeff is a multi-billionaire. He knew it was a risk, but it was a risk he was willing to take. That's what Joshua did. It was a risk, but he bet on God. When the people of Israel came out of Egypt, Moses sent 12 spies into the land of Canaan to check it out. They came back, 10 of them said, we can't do it. They're too strong. Their cities are fortified. They've got some huge people. We'll get, we'll get slaughtered. Only two, Joshua and Caleb, believed that God would give them the land. If they'd taken a poll, 10 out of 12, 83% would have said, we can't do it. We can't take the inher our inheritance. Remember that when you see a poll that certain percentage of Americans believe we should do this. Doesn't mean they're right. In this case, 83% were desperately wrong. I can think of a second reason there's a disconnect between who we are and who God calls us to be. We don't claim God's promises. Read this with me. I will give you every place where you set your foot. As I promised Moses, your territory. <clears throat> God promised that he would give them the land, every place where they set their foot. 
If Joshua got afraid, uh, all he had to do is remember God's promise. And God always keeps his promises. God promised the land, but Joshua had to claim it. Do you know God's promises? This is why I talk to you so much about how important it is to read the Bible. This is where we, the Bible is where we learn God's promises. Third, we don't practice God's presence. This is so important. Think of all the reasons Joshua could have been afraid. The book begins, after the death of Moses, the Lord said to Joshua, now get ready to cross the Jordan. He might have thought Moses is dead. So it's time to grieve and retreat. He must have wondered he was following a dynamic leader. Would the people follow him? And how would they get across the Jordan? And if they did, how could they defeat the Canaanites? They were some of the most wicked and ruthless people the world has ever known. They sacrificed babies in worship. They practiced sacred prostitution in orgies in their worship. Many dedicated themselves to witchcraft. They used child sacrifice and sacred prostitution using the most vulnerable members of the community, babies and virgins, to manipulate their gods. Some of the Canaanites were tall, giant-sized people. Remember Goliath? They had walls around their cities. Joshua must have thought, these people eat people like us for breakfast. Four times Joshua is told to be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Only be strong and courageous. Why does God repeat the command, be strong and courageous, four times? Surely because Joshua felt that he was weak. When God says be strong, it's a sure sign that the person he tells it to is feeling weak. <clears throat> when God says do not be afraid, the person he's addressing is feeling af afraid. When God says do not be discouraged, it means we are likely to be prone to give up. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. <clears throat> As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. God promises that he will be with him. He, provided, he promised to provide Joshua with all the strength he needed. On our own, we have reason to be afraid, but with God embedded in us, we can have confidence. Jesus said much the same thing. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus says he has all authority over all creatures, and he promises to never leave us, so we don't need to be afraid. Let me read you a true story. We have three sons. Marcus is the oldest, then Nathan, and then Simeon. When Nathan was three, we began to notice some developmental lag. He didn't talk. He struggled learning to walk. My wife, who is a teacher, thought we should have him tested. We took him to a special program at the University of Illinois and discovered that Nathan had several learning difficulties and would probably never function in a traditional classroom. Our shock and disappointment soon turned to resolve, and we were determined to help Nathan be all God had created him to be, nothing more, nothing less. Learning most things was a challenge for Nate, but he seemed to enjoy life. Marcus, his older brother, helped Nathan learn <coughs> to tie his shoes, put on his coat, and generally filled the role of older brother. Simeon, our youngest son, was the baby and worked that turf for all it was worth. As Nathan grew, his kind, gentle, gregarious spirit infected our entire family. Our three boys seemed to enjoy each other's company, and fights were infrequent. In many ways, we feel like Erica is, 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 serves that role in, in our family. She has cerebral palsy and has brought the whole family together. The year Nathan entered third grade, he learned something important about life. I was helping my wife with some household chores one day when I heard a commotion. My boys, all three of them, were on the verge of a full-blown fight in the backyard. 
I walked down the steps and into the midst of what looked like a sumo wrestling match with Nathan on one side and Simeon and Marcus on the other. Using my don't ever think about not doing what I'm telling you to do voice, I pointed toward the back door and said, inside. All three boys sat on the floor in a semicircle and I joined them. Their faces were red and sweaty and their bodies convulsed with each breath. Silence is always an ally in these moments, so I just sat and looked at them for several seconds. What's going on, I asked. For the last few days, you guys have been in each other's throat, snipping and quarreling, and I want to know what's going on. Marcus, the sixth grader at the time, and the leader spoke first. Dad, it's Nate. I don't know what's wrong with him, but for the last week, every time I say or do anything, he jumps on me. Simeon raised one of his first grade hands as though he were watching for his teacher to call on him while he pointed at Nate with the other. That's right, Dad. It's not us. It's Nate. I looked at Nathan, who sat slightly apart from the other two, stone-like and stoic, folded arms, red face, a cauldron of indignation and anger. Nathan, I said, what's going on? The statue broke its pose as Nathan shrugged his shoulders. Nathan, I want an answer, and I want it now. Nathan's eyes hollowed like twin caves gaping open and fixed without any apparent focus. In quiet, almost monotone song, he began to describe the scene he was obviously watching on the projector of his memory. I go to special reading class every day. And every day there is this boy. He's a fourth grader. He wait for me outside my room and he walk alongside me. He make fun of me and he laugh at my reading book. And he tells everyone in the play yard that I'm dumb. And he make me feel really bad in my heart. Caves are wet, lonely, dark places. And those two drip slow, silent tears because of the sadness and pain they watched on memory screen. And the room became acquainted with the sound of compassion. Gentle, warm drops from father and brothers fell into new, loyal laps. Through my own tears, I looked at three sons who sat Indian style on the floor of the family room. One of them felt alone. Two of them felt ashamed. All three of them waited for me to say something fatherly. I've never been comfortable speaking with lumps in my throat, so I decided to use my the man who controls his tongue as the perfect man voice and say nothing. I wait and watched and I learned after many moments of silence, Marcus' wet face turned to Nathan's. He asked a simple question of his younger brother, but the implications of the asking were more than magical. They were profound. With quiet, almost awful resolve in his voice, he erased all of Nathan's aloneness. I watched Nathan's countenance change as his older brother walked into the midst of the project room of his mind and stopped the film with three words, Who's the guy? I suppose Mark, Marcus could have mapped out a strategy for what to say the next time the problem came up. He could have suggested that Nathan go to the principal. He could have said it didn't matter what other people think. But the truth is, he chose to identify with Nathan by becoming personally involved in addressing the issue of might and authority and power. And for the next several weeks, when it was time to walk to special reading class, Marcus and Nathan walked together. Sixth graders are a lot bigger than fourth graders. The play yard looks different when you know a sixth grader. The walk to special reading class takes on new dimensions when your big brother benevolently watches out for you. If you see me on the street today, and I seem to be pushing and shoving, locked in a sumo wrestling match with the rest of the world, angry for no apparent reason, it might be because there's a fourth grader in my life who waits for me every day outside my door. His na name may be insecurity, maybe obesity, maybe loneliness, maybe rejection. But every day as I try to live my life, he comes alongside me, scoffing and laughing at my failures. He taunts and teases and tells me I'm dumb and I feel really bad in my heart. If you see me on the street today, remind me, will you? I need to hear it again. I have an older brother. He knows exactly how I feel. Death waited outside his classroom door and dragged him into another dark, wet cave, jeering, laughing because he dared to assume that he was God. Meek, humble, dying Prince of Peace who stopped the projection screens with three small words. It is finished. I've heard it all before, but I still need to be reminded. For three days, my older brother listened to all the taunts and jeers of hell. He looked loneliness and rejection in the face. 
He grabbed grave by the throat and choked eternal life out of death. Then he turned on the light of the world in that dark cave once and for all and walked out. He sat down at God's, God's right hand to watch the play yard. He scrawled his own unique message in blood across the walls and stumbling blocks of life. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good courage, for I have overcome the world. Jesus. Young married, Christ's presence can help you navigate the churning waters of getting to know your new mate. Teenager, Jesus inside of you can give you all that you need to do well in your classes and, and deal with the turbulence relationships at school. Single person, with Christ at your side, you have all the strength you need to navigate work, school, relationships, and family dynamics. Grandparent, and some of you I know have been thrust into the role of virtually parenting your grandchildren. Christ will give you all the wisdom you need to know how you can help your grandchild. We're disconnected from all that God wants us to be when we don't believe in our inheritance, we don't claim God's promise, we don't practice God's presence, and finally, when we don't reflect on God's Word. The Word of God was the fourth thing that helped Joshua claim the promised land. Maybe you're not a Bible person. You're not sure if you believe it's true or if it's different from any other book. Well, here's what you need to know. Every author of the Bible claims to write under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That God is the ultimate author of the Bible is the claim from cover to cover. You say, well, I don't know if I believe that. Well, consider this. There are 300 prophecies about the life of of Christ that were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. All of those are written between 400 and 1,000 years before he came. What are the odds? Suppose we have a book in our hand written in 1800, and the book prophesies that in the 20th century there'll be two world wars. The second one will be ended by the dropping of an atomic bomb. We'll have a sitting president assassinated and a famous civil rights leader facing the same fate. And the advent of the internet and cell phones will change our lives. Wouldn't we trust it? Joshua did. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. This is God to Joshua. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. God tells Joshua to meditate on it. Meditate is more than read. It means to think about it. It means to uh, uh, reflect on what it means. It means to take notes about it. That's why I'm always telling you, please pick up these journals and, and, and write something down about what you read. So take notes in your journal or on your cell phone. Greg Hawkins and Carly Parkinson's, the author of Reveal, uh, identify four types of Christ followers. Those that are exploring Christ, just kind of beginning those growing with Christ, kind of moving forward with him. Those that are close to Christ, feel like, you know, really in a good spot with him. And those who are Christ-centered. They ask the question, how do you move up the ladder spiritually? They said the number one strategy, the number one practice, by far, is Bible reflection. God tells Joshua to meditate on it day and night. That means to think about it a lot. This means to me that we should memorize it. If I memorize a verse, I can think about it throughout the day. A significant part of what I know about the Bible came through memorization. You know, I would memorize verses, and then I would think about them through the day, and then insights would come to me. This is what God means. Sunday school teachers, youth leaders... 
Parents, I think we're making a big mistake if we are not memorizing Scripture verses with our kids. 90% of the verses I know I learned before I was 22. Then I was able to think about them as I drove my car, as I rode my bike, as I swam laps in the pool. Maybe this is the year you need to get serious about memorizing Scripture so you can meditate on it. Did you know that we have a memory verse every week in our journal? It's actually in bold print. That, that means don't skip over it. Why don't you try it? Most of those verses are what I call classic verses. Notice the reason we meditate on the Bible is so that we obey it. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. We don't memorize verses just to have facts in our brains. It's so that we can put them into practice. Do you feel spiritually stuck? Well, here's the good news. With God's help, you can close the gap between where you are and where God wants you to be. Indeed, the person God wants you to be. Take out your program. Uh, I've, I've put a sentence in there, and I'd like you to take a pen. We have pens under every seat in the house, or they're supposed to be. And just put your name in the blank there. The Lord gave... Ron, all the life we had sworn to give and, put your name, took possession of it. The Lord gave, put your name in there, rest all around and not an enemy stood. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken. Put your name again. Imagine it. You at full throttle. You experiencing God's incomparably great power. You as God intended you to be. Isn't it time you change your mailing address from the wilderness to the promised land? Lord God, thank you for putting this book in the Bible, Joshua. The encouragement that our best days can be ahead of us. And that you have incomparably great power for us. If we commit our lives to you, you put your son inside of us, resurrection power, to face whatever we face each day. I want to give you a chance to pray. Right now, maybe you want to experience God's incomparably great power. So why don't you tell him that right now? Maybe what you need to, 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 to practice is uh, that you believe in that inheritance, that power available. Or God's promises, claim them. Or God's presence, that you forget that he's with you and you, you think you're all alone. Or you need to reflect on God's word. Would you make the commitment to him right now and say, God, I want to I wanna experience your accomplished great power. You pray. Lord God, thank you that we're not alone in this world to face the challenges that life brings us. But if we believe in you and invite you into our lives, you give us your incomparably great power. Help us to rely on that this year, starting today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.